it looks like they're spending on average of thirty to a hundred dollars per staff member for training. To your knowledge, is that accurate? Uh, is that is that close to being accurate? Yeah, because it, most of the training that they do is only internal training. So. Uh, Staff members get credit based on how many Hubbard-related courses they have done, not um, not outside training and continuing education. So, you know, certain like withdrawal students or with people who work in the withdrawal area, sure they may have they may have to take a CPR class, um, but you know, you bring one instructor in, you can do 50 certifications for 250 bucks, let's say. So, it, it there's not really a whole lot of outside training that goes on for stuff. Most of it is simply internal training. If, if they work in one level, then they might do a course on the next level of the program uh, or a next higher position on the organization chart for that center. And this training really has nothing to do with actual drug rehabilitation. It has to do with so-called Hubbard Life courses and things like that? Exactly. Okay. Um, so essentially, when Narconon says these are highly trained drug detox specialists, there really is nothing there uh, in the training program that really even familiarizes them with real drug detoxification. True. Yeah, yeah that's correct. It's, it's, it's based on, for example, their, their withdrawal is only about Hubbard's withdrawal information. Their, their detox, their sauna program is only from like Hubbard's Clear Body, Clear Mind. Um, there's very little, if any, outside training that goes on. So they're highly trained as only an internal thing. It's all about image and PR, how, it, how they represent themselves to be legitimized in the public eye, such as using familiar terms or using psychological terms to describe themselves when they have zero connection to such a thing. Let's talk about the political schmoozing that was going on while you were at Arrowhead. What are some of the things you saw that would make you worried as a citizen that maybe your government, state government, had some questionable dealings or individuals in the government? Well, looking back on it today, there's there were many things that uh, at the time I thought was cool because I was a part of that movement. But but really looking at it from like you're saying from. The, the side of a citizen or or somebody else outside that would be concerned about it. You know, we took a trip to Washington D.C. for example, and back then uh, it was it was me, it was Clark Carr, who's the president of Narcon International, Rena Weinberg, who was the president of Able International, who's been locked up um, at Scientology's international base for about six years now, and Erica Christensen, the actress at the time, had. Um, was part of Traffic, you know, the movie Traffic, where it was nominated for an Academy Award, I believe. And um, so she was invited to be part of the Drug Bar's Advisory Committee for Demand Reduction, which is a fancy word for drug education. And so because she was personally invited, because she had that role in the film, we all went out, including one of the vice presidents from Scientology Celebrity Center, and we all went out and tried to set up meetings using her as an angle to get in and gain favor with people in the DEA, people at Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, people at Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, uh, various senators and representatives. And the same thing, in, well, in different manners, were used in Oklahoma directly, which is how can we find any kind of favor with these people and use that to our advantage, either to affect legislation on our behalf or to gain some other favor to either possibly look the other way on something or gain an endorsement of some type uh, that we can then flash on our website or parade around to, to other officials and say, look, your boss gave us his signature, so we must be okay. And I understand that you are aware of an individual by the name of Connie Johnson, who is a state senator, and there was some dealings with her that gave you some pause for real concern. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, when I um, when I was still president, then we had we had begun doing some different legislative activities over in Oklahoma City, and one of the things that came up was Connie Johnson was was an aide to a senator previous to then, and she had said, "Look, you know, I know somebody who who needs some help. Is there anything you can do?" So 
Gary Smith and his wife specifically took it on as a project to bring this person into the program at no charge and uh, put this person through the program, through the entire thing, free of charge, as a favor to this person who we knew worked for a senator before she was elected to her own Senate seat. And, um, and then after that, recruited her to be a staff member and positioned her or in my office, like didn't actually didn't even have any say so in it. It was like this person is going to work in your office because of her connections. She's going to be one of your assistants, whether I wanted it or not, didn't matter. And later on, uh, Connie Johnson becomes it start, runs for and becomes elected to the Oklahoma Senate herself. And so, it, it winds up being that okay, now you have somebody in in an official capacity who you've done a favor for, who you're going to expect a favor from later on down the road and she was also instrumental in trying to push through she was a co-sponsor of, of a bill that narconon wanted to go through that's correct there was a, at least a minimally a draft of a bill that was located that she was a co-sponsor or co-author of and uh it, you know and that's a perfect example of why i was i was gone uh, at least from the from the position of president at that time um that it came in so i I didn't have the exact details of how that particular thing came out, but um, but yeah, that's an example. You know, a year or two later, all of a sudden you have a bill that comes up that's in favor of Narcan on Arrowhead without naming them specifically. That's going to affect the the laws governing treatment centers in the state, and sure enough, she's a co-author of it. Narcan goes to great lengths and does a very poor job. I might mention. To say it is secular and does not have any direct connection to the church Scientology. Why? Why is Narconon Scientology? What makes it Scientology? First of all, the courses themselves, the books that are in the Narconon program, are all books that are found in a Church of Scientology. It's a different cover. It may be presented in a slightly different manner, but it is. Some of them, or most of them, even have the exact same titles. Uh, the training routines, the TRs that are done in Narcon, they're the same TRs used at a Church of Scientology that are used to train Scientology auditors that everybody goes through when they become a Scientologist. Uh, the purification rundown at a church is the exact same thing that uh, the sauna detox program at a Narcon. Um, other books include the basic study manual um, uh, or the learning improvement course, depending on which way you look at it, or the the objectives, auditing. Objectives are auditing sessions that are done at a church and at an Arcanon, both. The ups and downs in life course, the changing conditions in life course, the personal values and integrity course, the way to happiness course. All those courses that are offered at Narconon are offered at churches as well. I understand, too, when people complete the Narconon course, they want them to do follow-up courses that are only held at Scientology buildings. Is that true, or is, that, is there something similar to that? It's often recommended, yeah. Uh, it's never... They're, they're careful because of so much pressure and so many, especially in the last 10 years of, of the internet, there's been so much more exposure about it that they have been less uh, pushy about it. So it, it really depends on the center and the situation. But yeah, it, there's many times where somebody will say, hey, I you know, I need to figure out something else I need to do. I say, well, you know, you have a, a Church of Scientology close to you. If you want to continue to study this material in more detail, then that's something that you can do there. Uh, it, it really depends on the situation and the staff and that kind of thing. I was, look, I was looking online and somebody had put up a general agreement between the Narconon Center and Narconon International. And this document basically lays out payments to be made. It lays out the authority that Narconon International has over the center. And one of the things I saw that was really interesting was there was a lot of language in it as to how you won't disparage the name of L. Ron Hubbard. You know, you'll use his name in a certain way. But it was completely absent of any discussion about patients' rights or, or the care of people. And I was wondering... You know, throughout the documents that, that Narconon centers have and sign on a daily basis, is there really a focus on, on the physical well-being or is there a lack of focus on, on the physical well-being of the individuals there? Well, it's it's clearly a lack of focus. Uh, I mean, first of all, from Narconon International standpoint, their their main marching orders are get money, 
and spread the word to increase the PR image of L. Ron Hubbard. The, that is, those are the two primary purposes so that somebody can be uh, sought after to bring into the church at that point. Because any, any activity that is connected to Scientology whatsoever, its ultimate goal as a part of that group is to, I mean, their, their stated purpose is to, quote unquote, clear the planet, to get them up to a certain point on their bridge to total freedom and then beyond. So every activity is with the goal of converting every single person to become a Scientologist. And that is their stated purpose, and, and they're pretty clear about that. So to, so to claim that they are involved in something for some other reason completely contradicts what their stated purpose is, first of all. But not only that, when you come down to the Narconon Centers, they really the, – it if a Narconon Center is going to be more compliant than another one, that's kind of up to them. Narconon International doesn't wind up enforcing enough of – uh, compliance with state laws because they're more concerned with the image and how you're representing their trademarks and how you're representing L. Ron Hubbard and uh, you better not alter the program because it's not allowed. So you can't be in compliance with the state laws if it goes against what our program says it's supposed to be. Yeah, it was very clear from that very basic entry-level document that what you're saying is right on the money. Um, I want you to take a moment and talk about what happens when the slop hits the fan, you know, that there's been a death, there's a PR nightmare. Who gets involved in that? Who's in control and what happens? Ultimately, where where it winds up, uh, not even ultimately, pretty much initially, is calls get made to and from uh, OSA, which is Office of Special Affairs for Church of Scientology. Narcanon centers have directors of legal affairs, which is an OSA-related position. In fact, OSA usually has to give clearance or approval to, to post somebody as a director of legal affairs. Uh, straight up through Narconon International and then Able International and, and the church, etc. So they have this entire network of legal and uh, governmental affairs that as soon as there's some kind of major thing like that that happens, immediately OSA is on the line. And not only are they giving directions, but they want information. They want to know exact details of what's happening. Has it hit the media yet? Has it hit online yet? Who knows? Who doesn't know? What are you doing? Have you contacted the family? And they start barking orders left and right. And it came to the point where I think even in, for example, the Patrick Desmond case, not only did they hide documents, which which were, were clearly known to exist by anybody who had any previous involvement to it, but they'd even alluded to that they later found out, leading to the sanctions you mentioned, that uh, Mary Reeser reported directly to the director of legal affairs at, or director of uh, special affairs at the church in Atlanta and the office of special affairs of Church International. And so that is, that is exactly what protocol is, is you have to notify the church when there's such a major problem like that and the church is involved from the get-go. And, and of course, let's just be clear here, this this is an organization that says that, they, that they're their own secular thing and they don't answer to the Church of Scientology, yet they're taking their marching orders from the intelligence wing of the Church of Scientology. And, and I just want to be clear, Narconon's not paying these people as advisors. These are people that are picking up the phone and have the authority just to tell and bully around people at Narconon. Is that correct? That is correct. That's exactly correct. Right. And that's why, that's why, for example, even when uh, they knew that there was a problem with the housing at the Georgia facility and, and uh, they even ordered her, first of all, to not get rid of their housing that they had then. And it unfortunately wound up in, in a very unnecessary death. So there's, there's... And then later... I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, say, and then later on, then trying to cover it up and... Now you wind up with Mary Reeser, who's going to wind up being the scapegoat, and she absolutely has culpability. However, uh, she is by no means the only one responsible. And she does not have um, permission to refuse uh, to follow OSA's um, directives. Is that correct? She can't say, well, I don't work for you. I'm not going to follow this, because what would happen to her if she did? She'd be she'd be ripped off post immediately and sent to uh, what they do uh, they call a sec check, uh, security check, where they're put on a meter and start looking.